I hope you can hear me clearly. This is a grab the mic webinar hosted by the Beam Exchange, providing a space for practitioners of market systems development to share knowledge and experience. And I am delighted today to introduce Harvey Coe, who's in London, and Ahmed Ban, who's in Mumbai. Harvey is uh, Managing Director and co-leader of the Inclusive Market Approach Area at FSG, and Afan is an Associate Director of FSG, responsible for helping to build and scale market-based solutions to development challenges in various sectors, including most recently education. Uh, Harvey and Afan are going to talk today about their recent research, which looked at historical examples of pro-poor inclusive economic transformation in various industries around the world. This research was undertaken with support from the Rockefeller Foundation and in part to help inform the foundation's strategy towards shaping inclusive markets in future. Before I hand over the microphone to Harvey, I just want to give you all a chance to take note of the way this WebEx console works if you haven't used it before. I want to draw your attention in particular to the chat box, which you'll see on the bottom right hand side of the uh, window. Um, you can use this chat box to send messages to everybody else who's participating or indeed to um, individuals. But I specifically want you to, um, to know that after the presentations of complete in about 35 minutes, um, I'll be taking questions from the audience for Harley or a fan. And I'd like to uh, invite you to use the chat box to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. Um, we've, you'll also notice that your microphones were muted when you joined the uh, call um, because there's so many people going to be joining. We would ask, I'd ask you please to keep them muted during the webinar if you're not a speaker. Uh, I hope that's clear for everyone. So I'm going to hand over now to Harvey. Thank you, Mike. Um, thank you, everyone else, for, for joining today. Um, it's a pleasure to be sharing our work um, with you all. Um, the, the report is available to download if you haven't already accessed it from the fsu.org website. Um, um, and, and I would encourage you to, to get hold of it because we'll be giving you some of the highlights today, but obviously we'll have a limited ability to go into detail in the time that we've got. Um, so if I dive in, technology to work. Uh, no. There we go. Um, so just by way of introduction, FSG, we're an international uh, nonprofit headquartered in Boston in the US, um, doing combination of research, advisory, and program facilitation um, in a number of areas. Um, our group is based in Mumbai, um, where our work really came out of the observation and conviction actually over 10 years ago that we needed to do something about the shape of economic growth and prosperity in a place like India, which was experiencing incredible economic growth, but where the fruits of that growth and prosperity were really going to the rich uh, and not to the majority of the population. And so since then, we've been doing a whole range of things from advice through to supporting entrepreneurs, through to advising governments on policies to try to shape uh, what we think of as inclusive markets. I should say that for most of that time, our definition of an inclusive market has been quite narrow, um, that it's been about uh, very selectively improving um, incomes or access to safe water or access to quality education um, for a specific group of low-income people. Um, but in the last couple of years, we've been challenged, I think, to have a, a broader and I think more complete view of what it might mean to have an inclusive market. Um, and one framework that we've been working with is this one that um, was actually developed by the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, who were our partners in, in this recent work. Um, and I won't go through all of the dimensions in detail, but broadly, I think what I'd love people to take away from it is that it's multidimensional that it's not just about, say, growing incomes or the level of resources in a system or a market, 
uh, but it's also about who is able to participate in that market. It's also about whether what they get out of it, their wages or their livelihoods, is equitable. It's also about whether those households experience stability and have reduced vulnerability to shocks and disruptions. And it's also about whether those gains are sustainable in the long run, i.e., are we sure that we're not robbing future generations to pay for the gains of today? So that's really been so the frame that we've really used to think about where we're headed. Now, most of the work that we've done in the last year and a bit has been thinking about how we get there. And I know that those of you who are on this call are probably thinking about that because you're working with market systems today to try to get us to some sort of destination um, that approximates um, this, this picture that I've just painted. Uh, and so what I'll do today, what the final I will do today is take you very briefly through two case studies that um, where we've drawn some pretty interesting lessons in terms of how to do this going forward and how and also about how change happens and we're very keen when we did the work not to look at programs or initiatives that people were running but actually just to look at history and think about you know against this backdrop of rising inequity where were the bright spots of progress in the other direction what could we learn about how that sort of change happened uh, so I'll do one and then I'll hand over to Rafan to, to do the second. Uh, the first one that I'm going to be speaking to is uh, the story of Gujarat Dairy. And uh, we like this one because it, it does exemplify many of the lessons that we found across our case studies. Uh, but also it's from just uh, up the road, if you like, from uh, Mumbai in, in the state of Gujarat. Um, now, we're doing this virtually, so I can't ask for a show of hands as to who actually recognizes this brand that I've just flashed up on the screen. But if you do recognize it, you probably spent some time in India, uh, where Amul is a, a truly iconic uh, consumer food brand, initially a dairy brand, but now actually in many different kinds of food, one of India's largest food businesses, uh, found in shops you know, all over the country. Um, but one of the most interesting things about it is it's not owned by a large corporation or a multinational. Uh, it's actually owned by um, several million smallholder dairy farmers. Uh, and it's incredibly vibrant uh, and growing um, and an important business in, in India, um, based in Gujarat. But it wasn't always like that. If you go back about 80 years, the situation in Gujarat is very, very different. Dairying is very small scale. Uh, there's no market really for uh, for milk or other dairy products, um, and if you're if you've got a buffalo or two, you're probably just milking it for yourself or for your for your neighbours. Fast forward to 2016, and the Amul business, or rather more correctly, the Gujarat Cooperative Milk Marketing Federation, is a huge business producing a very wide range of goods. Um, it produces 6.4 billion tons of milk a year. It's got 3.6 million farmers who own it, um, and it generates a turnover over 4 billion US dollars. So it's a large business. Um, but the most remarkable thing about it, I think, is that most of that value that's generated, that $4 billion, actually goes back to the farmers. So if you compare the chart on the, the bar on the left, which shows how much that final market value goes back to the dairy farmers of Gujarat versus what you'd normally see in an ag value chain where say 20 to 30 percent of the value uh, in another value chain we've chosen fruits and veg in india um, goes back to the farmers that's a huge difference in terms of the share of value that's created uh, in the value chain going to farmers and so i go back to that multi-dimensional lens that i introduced earlier about economic inclusion uh, we see that it's progressed on several aspects of this. So uh, participation has increased, not just geographically um, across the state, but also increasingly it's uh, included excluded costs in that uh, activity. Um, as I said before, the, uh, um, the, the share of the value that the farmers receive has now also increased uh, to over 70% of the market price. Uh, there's growth, not just in terms of income, but in terms of material resources and efficient coming into the market system. Uh, and also, because of the strategy of diversifying and adding value to their products, they've been able to keep the incomes of the farmers quite consistent, even where there's been volatility in the price of milk itself. So progress on multiple dimensions of this uh, framework. Uh, 
Um, the question, I suppose, is how did it get there? And when we used to think about this story before we did this last project, we, we thought of it as a story really of exceptional entrepreneurialism, uh, mainly centered around this man, Bagheez Korean, who is known as the milkman of India. And this is the cover of his autobiography uh, with a forward from India's uh, best known industrialist. Uh, so he's, he's a well-known man. And it's certain that many of his innovations around business and technology and creating um, the, the federation that we see today uh, was a key part of the story and uh, was a key part of its success. But the more we dug into it, we, the more we realized that actually this was not the full story of how this change had been achieved. Um, and to understand that, we need to go back into history. So I'd started in the 1940s, and that's where I'll pick up now. Um, this is 1940s colonial Bombay. Um, what happens in 1942 is that there is an outbreak of disease, which is traced back to contaminated milk. And so the government in 1942 decides to institute what it calls the Bombay Milk Scheme to secure a safe supply of milk from Gujarat in the north, about 350 kilometers away, uh, to the city of Bombay. And because it's such a long distance of travel, it said we need to find a private trader who can pasteurize and safely transport the milk across this distance. Um, and so they went to a private trader called Paulson's, uh, awarded Paulson's the monopoly over the supply of milk to the city, um, and so secure a safe supply of milk for the residents of Bombay. In a way, this is great news for the farmers in Gujarat because they now have a market for the milk that they, uh, they produce. Uh, on the other hand, it's terrible news for the farmers of Bombay because they are dealing with a single buyer for their milk uh, who pays them. We don't have the exact numbers, but we can be assured that it was a pittance uh, for the milk they uh, produced because he had the monopoly of the trade to this big new market. Uh, unsurprisingly, the farmers are unhappy uh, and they go to the leaders of the independence movement at the time in Gujarat and ask for help. And they uh, send some of their leaders to mobilize and collectivize the farmers uh, who then go on strike because they're demanding the right to supply directly to the Bombay market and they're being prevented uh, from doing so. Now, after several weeks of strikes, the government relents and allows the farmers to supply uh, to the Bombay market. Now, this has no practical effect in the near term because the farmers have no facilities, no way to transport the milk, and so it's just a legal right. But this is about to change. The following year, India achieves independence. The independence leaders who are helping the farmers have now moved into the corridors of power in Delhi. And in 1948, what they do is they lease half of a government creamery in Gujarat, close to where the farms are, uh, to the farmers. And for the first time, the farmers can now process the milk, transport it to the Bombay market. Uh, this is really where the business story of what becomes Arbol uh, begins. Now, that uh, Bagheez Kurian, that milkman of India, the entrepreneur that we introduced earlier, he's actually the manager in the government half of this creamery and he's so attracted by the work of the farmers that he comes over to really join them and lead them and, and really kind of develop the business from then on. The next big leap forward comes in the 50s. Uh, one of the issues with uh, milk production uh, and buffalo milk production in this case, is that there's a lot more milk produced in the winter months than in the summer months, but that's not what happens to demand. And so the way you deal with that is you convert it into milk powder and other products. But no one had yet figured out a way at that point to convert buffalo milk, which is predominantly what this was, uh, into skim milk powder and all those other products like butter and cream and so on. Um, and so one of the big breakthroughs that Amal made uh, the co-ops made rather was to uh, move into skim milk powder and into butter and other products. Uh, the problem was that many of these markets were controlled by big brands. Uh, butter, for instance, was controlled by the big import brands uh, like Anchor from New Zealand. And so the new co-ops had quite a tough time trying to break into that market. But again here, events intervened. Two years later, India ran into a big balance of payments crisis 
and the government was looking for ways to curtail imports uh, so that it would be hemorrhaging less uh, less currency. And so Amul saw uh, a, an opportunity to uh, get the government to curtail and then later ban imports of butter, uh, only temporarily. But in the time that that was in place, uh, Amul was able to really uh, uh, conquer a, a very substantial part of this market and establish a, a, a commanding position, and it's kept that to this day. And from that uh, position in butter, it's moved on into ice cream and chocolate and curd and all, all sorts of other things um, that it's producing now. Uh, I'll, I'll go very quickly through the next decade. Essentially, the, the unions collectivize into, into a federation to pool resources in marketing, distribution, R&D. But also the government takes a stronger role in the 70s and develops a, a dairy development corporation to facilitate the growth of the model across more parts of the state. The upshot of which is the growth of the model uh, across practically the whole state. Um, what we've done in the report is we've tried to map this overall timeline of change, um, and I know this is quite a lot to look at uh, on screen, uh, but I do encourage you to look at this in the report. And one of the things that we, did, we found when we mapped the innovations that happened over time was that, of course, some of them were about business models and practices that you could see in the lower half of the slide. Um, but we also saw many innovations around market rules and state support. Um, and there were particular cycles of change uh, around, uh, you know, certainly the Bombay Milk Scheme and the right to sell to the Bombay Milk Scheme butter ban, the establishment of, you know, the Dairy Corporation, and, and even later on, the liberalization of the dairy sector that I didn't uh, go into. Um, and each of those contributed as much as the business changes to the shifts in the overall market. Um, and then the other layer that we found, not just with this case, but with many other cases, was the role of external events, um, or perhaps in other um, areas of literature, critical junctures um, that occurred that created some of the conditions and energy uh, that could then be exploited to drive uh, changes in the market. And so the other part you know, of this is that obviously the kinds of innovators that you would expect to be involved in these uh, would also be a more diverse range. So not only did we have business entrepreneurs uh, leading this effort, we also had leaders of the independence movement, we had technologists, we had political leaders in the Indian government, particularly in the 70s, uh, who were trying to uh, further scale the sector. And so instead of this single heroic entrepreneur or innovator, what we see is actually a kind of panoply of innovations and innovators uh, who are really coming together over time uh, to create this change. And so if I just pull up a bit and think about the key themes of this uh, very, very briefly, um, of course, you know, the business models at the core still matter. You know, one of the most appealing things about the story is how actually the, the Amol business has managed to increase the value it generates by integrating down the value chain, diversifying across more goods. Uh, really investing in marketing to achieve a, a premium of market. So it does, you know, create value. But how that value is shared is also important, right? And so the ownership and control of the business, the fact that that is still with the farmers uh, rather than with the third party means that most of the value that's created actually goes back, uh, back to them. Um, of course, if you look across the timeline, it's very, very clear that market rules and state support were a huge part of this change, uh, not just the change in business models and behaviors. Um, that suggests that, in fact, we are looking at a wider set of innovators and entrepreneurs than just those in the business sector alone. Um, the other thing that we see very clearly, not just in this case, but in others, is you know, actually that many of these um, innovations and potentialities were within the system anyway. They weren't brought in from the outside. Uh, and actually where the most uh, striking changes occurred was when, uh, say, external funders or investors came in to support the particular change agents in the system uh, who were positioned and ready to make that change. Never waste a good crisis. Um, this is, you know, probably uh, 
obvious in, in these stories, uh, but one of the things that did occur to us from all these cases are actually, you know, crises and external events create a lot of energy for disruption. Uh, and we should think about how we uh, use those when we come or how we position ourselves in advance of one of those to exploit them when they come. Uh, and then finally, even though I said, you know, there's a broader range of innovative entrepreneurs here, one of the things that's quite striking is Verghese Kurian himself was actually a leader who was able to navigate both business and political dynamics um, and use one to get a create advantage in, in the other and vice versa. Uh, and so that's another key hallmark of what we found. Um, so I'm going to now hand over quickly to uh, Irfan, uh, who can take us through the second case study. And then after that, we'll, we'll pause uh, and, and take questions. So let me just do that. Got it. Thanks so much, Harvey. Uh, there we go. Thanks, Harvey. Uh, so the second case study that I'm going to take you through is about the tourism market in Costa Rica. Um, so very different from Amul. Um, so if you look at Costa Rica in the 1980s, it's a country that has two main problems. The first is rapid deforestation. It's losing about 4% of its forest cover every single year. And the second has to do with economic volatility. So it's an agricultural export-led economy, and this is a time when many of its key exports, like sugar, coffee, and beef, uh, are going through massive price swings and, and, and price falls. So if you're, if you're an everyday farmer who's involved in this work, A, your income is not very high, and B, it's not very stable. Now, fast forward to today, um, 2016, um, forest cover in Costa Rica has actually doubled since the 1980s. So Costa Rica is one of the very few countries that has been able to reverse deforestation. And the broader economy has actually been able to switch away from the incredibly volatile agri-export market and been able to focus on services particularly tourism as a way of earning foreign income, and within tourism, particularly ecotourism. Now, ecotourism is really important because it is a model that does two things. It prioritizes sustainability and how it functions, and two, it focuses on ensuring that the gains and value created from tourist activity really goes back to the communities that um, are hosting the tourists. Um, not to mention it's a much more stable form of income for the country. Costa Rica has actually had consistent increases in tourist ar arrivals and revenues from tourism since the 1980s, barring a slight dip following the 2008 um, financial crisis. And much like the Amul story and many of the other case studies that we studied, this is also a case where we see progress along multiple aspects of economic inclusion. So you have the obvious increased contribution to GDP, you have the environmental benefit where increased forest or increased forest cover, and probably one of the most striking um, and important things, which was the reduction in poverty. So Costa Rica, uh, there was a 16% decrease in poverty levels in the communities that were neighboring protected areas between the 1970s and 2000s. And over 70% of that reduction is actually attributable to tourism-related activities. So much like the Costa Rica, uh, the Amul story, uh, progress along multiple aspects of this framework here as well. Now, coming to kind of how this change happened and how this transformation occurred, it's really a story with two different tracks. The first has to do with the conservation movement and the establishment of the backbone infrastructure for, tour for ecotourism in Costa Rica today, which is its impressive network of uh, national parks and private reserves. The second part of the story has to do with the actual business side of it, which is kind of the growth in ecotourism businesses and the demand for those businesses. And we'll touch on both of those stories uh, over, over the ne next few minutes. But I, I wanted to start with um, the conservation story and, and the establishment of the national parks and reserves, because really without that infrastructure, there is no ecotourism in Costa Rica today. Over half of all visitors to Costa Rica visit one of, uh, one of these national parks or private reserves. Now, the first private reserve in Costa Rica was established in 1965 in a place called Cabo Blanco, 
but it wasn't actually done proactively by the government. It was done by a Scandinavian couple called the Wesbergs who were disturbed by the environmental degradation that they were seeing, basically worked very hard, lobbied the government, raised funds, and were able to buy a private reserve for themselves. But this proved to be really important in the grander scheme of things because with the establishment of Cabo Blanco, alongside other events, and particularly pressure from the conservationist movement, the government really starts thinking, how do we start, if we're going to establish private reserves, how do we start managing this land in a more systemic manner? So there's a committee that's constituted to look at this, and a landmark forestry law is passed in 1969. And that's the law that really manages and establishes national parks and private reserves in Costa Rica today. Now, although the law was instrumental, it really wasn't just the government that was behind the law. A really key part of this was the role played by the conservationist movement in Costa Rica, uh, both local Costa Ricans as well as experts and scientists who were working in Costa Rica at the time. But probably one of the most important figures was a individual called Mario Bozza, who was a passionate conservationist who studied national park systems around the world and lobbied incredibly hard for this law to be passed and the system to be created. And what was interesting about the way in which he did it was that he was really arguing for the economic benefits of um, establishing this system rather than simply the conservation benefits that would come from uh, protecting Costa Rica's incredible biodiversity. And while the passage of the law in 1969 was incredibly important, it really wasn't enough on its own because the increase in international tourist arrivals to come visit um, the, the parks and natural, reser natural reserves doesn't happen for a good 15 years after the passage of the law in the mid-1980s. And that's where we kind of move into the second track of the story about um, the growth of the ecotourism business model itself. And what's really interesting about the first set of pioneering entrepreneurs who set up ecotourism businesses in Costa Rica in the late 70s and through the 80s is that this is a, bunch, this is a group of entrepreneurs who are incredibly influenced by the counterculture of the 60s and 70s. So they really hold value, deeply values around environmentalism, they believe in values around equity and giving back to society, and they wanted to build businesses that reflected these values, and that's what they went ahead and did. And that really has been a key part of kind of the equity dimensions within this, uh, within this particular story, because as many of you may already have heard, mass tourism often is criticized for the way in which it leaks money out of the country and really doesn't give back to the people. But here were a group of entrepreneurs who were really focused on preserving the environment and making sure that the benefits went back to the local communities as well. On the demand side of the story, once again, kind of the social, uh, changing cultural norms um, and social forces really play, play an important role because the 1980s is the time when actors like the Rainforest Alliance and the Rainforest Action Network are waging a very public campaign to raise awareness about the destruction of the rainforests. And what this means is that across North America, which is Costa Rica's main tourism market, people are watching on their TV screens rainforests for the first time in a way that they've never really seen them before. And there's a the demand for coming in and seeing and experiencing biodiversity and natural forests is really growing at this time as well. But much like the Gujarat dairy story, external events come into play at this point and play a really key role in catalyzing changes in this market. And there are two particular events that I wanted to draw your attention to. The first is a debt crisis in the early 1980s, and this really focuses the government's attention on trying to uh, trying to find an alternative form of income for the country, and they land on tourism and ecotourism in particular. So there's a massive um, investment on behalf on from the government to try to position Costa Rica as a global ecotourism destination. The other thing that happens is in 1987, when President Oscar Arias receives the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to bring um, to resolve conflicts in Central America. Now, this is important because it, in the minds of international tourists, it starts differentiating Costa Rica from other countries in Central America and starts making it a much more peaceful, desirable destination to visit. And really from that point on, 
the tourism industry in Costa Rica hasn't looked back. It's been growing, and there have continued to be evolutions that have been really beneficial uh, from an, a greater inclusion perspective. One of which, for example, is the growth of community-based rural tourism, which was championed by UNDP in the late 1990s and by the local NGOs, um, which promotes a model where tourism businesses are owned by the community rather than private individuals so that the benefits are also distributed more evenly within society. However, this is definitely not a perfect story and challenges remain and continue to grow. One of the key challenges has to do with the problem of greenwashing, where businesses which don't really adhere to the principles of ecotourism nonetheless claim the label and market themselves as such. Now, the government in 1997 came up with the Certificate of Sustainable Tourism System to try to address this problem and really differentiate between genuine operators and others. Unfortunately, it's a system that hasn't been strong enough or widespread enough to really address the problem at the scale at which it exists. So the future for the for the for this particular market is certainly interesting. There are very uh, there are very positive um, influences that are there as well, but there are certainly um, pressing challenges as well. Um, and at this point, Harvey, I know you wanted to go back to some of the key themes um, that came through on our case studies. Harvey, have we lost you? Uh, oh, I was on mute. Oh, well I was done. On mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so all the same themes, I think, really kind of run through this as well. Uh, I'll just pick up on a few. I mean, ownership control, I don't know that we touched too much on just now, but the reality is that most of these businesses that are funds describing are owned by uh, local residents, and of course, the more, most recent move into community tourism is especially uh, heavy on that aspect. Um, so that's uh, you know creating much more equity in terms of how the value is being shared. Uh, the new thing, probably from this story, that we don't see so much in the Gujarat Dairy story is is this story about societal norms and, and ethics, um, and that's both in terms of um, local norms and ethics so the rise of the uh, environmental ethic in, in Costa Rica that underpins much of the change, both in terms of the actual market rules as well as the businesses. And then also this kind of international uh, um, ethic around uh, ethical consumerism and ethical tourism that's leveraged through certain mechanisms uh, to, uh, to drive changes in, in behavior and, and business behavior. Um, Although the final point that Irfan makes about greenwashing also points to some of the weaknesses of that. So if we don't have strong mechanisms that can translate those ethics uh, into informed choice, uh, then you lead to risks such as greenwashing uh, uh, in a set, essentially compromising the gains that we get from, from the market change. Um, so I'm probably going to finish it there. I'll just leave you with two very quick images before we go to questions and hand over to Mike. Um, the first is that uh, you know, just our conception of a whole market system, I think, through this process has changed because we've taken this very longitudinal uh, time series view. Um, and it's really moved from thinking of a market like this, which is this incredibly intricate uh, machine that has all these parts where we could analyze it by sector and think about where we want to intervene in order to get certain outcomes by getting, you know, pieces of this to do what we want them to do. Um, and instead move to a conception that's a bit more like this, which is that market systems are already changing. They're not sitting there in some sort of inert way waiting for us to act on them. But they have a history. They've already been moving in the past. They've not been static all this time. And they've got a range of possible futures. And what we are doing is essentially joining that market system uh, on a point in its journey and trying to amplify certain potentialities that we think could take it in a more inclusive uh, direction. Uh, one of the quotes I'm very fond of from Ashvin Dayal, a colleague of the Rockefeller Foundation, is he says, the, the mistake that we make or trap that we fall into often is that we assume that day one of the program for us is also day one of the change for everyone else in the system. 
um, and clearly uh, in most situations that we're working in that is not the case uh, and so this is reorienting ourselves towards that reality as we begin to engage. Right on that note I'm going to hand over back to Mike uh, for the questions. Thank you very much, Harvey. That's a uh, um, very eloquent presentation by, by you and Irfan. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. I've been uh, keeping track of the questions that have been coming in in the chat box. And if, you've, if anyone would like to take this moment uh, to add some more questions in there, I will do my best to pick as many of them as possible to hand, on, hand over to um, Harvey and Irfan to answer. But so just, just to start, there's a couple of really practical, simple questions that I thought might be worth um, clarifying, um, about the, particularly about the ML case, um, Harvey. So none of them are very complicated. I'll, run, I'll, probably, I'll just run all three of them past you. So one is um, the, uh, when you, in the early stages, you're talking about the profit that, that Amal was making and the benefits that it was generating for farmers, but was that going to the cooperatives or directly to the farmers, and, and what were the overheads involved in running the cooperatives? Um, second quick question was, how much did the development of UHT milk um, with its extended shelf life impact the, uh, the operation? Those questions from Dick Tinsley. And a third question, which I think you may have addressed later on, was um, did, you ha did, the, uh, did you hear about any efforts in neighboring states to replicate the ML model? And, and if so, how, how did that pan out? Were they successful? So, oh, thanks, Mike. Um, I can definitely speak to one and three, and I don't know if any of you have thoughts on, on two. Um, so, yes, the, the value that's created is going back to, to the farmers themselves. So that's after taking out all the costs of running uh, the business as well as the government mechanisms of the, um, of, of the co-ops and the federation. So, you know, an impressively high number. We've checked it uh, three, four times. The number does fluctuate, obviously, from year to year. Um, but you know, somewhere in the in the 70s is is uh, is where it tends to end up. Uh, and then in terms of replication, there have been attempts, not just in India, but actually more broadly around the world, to replicate the model. Uh, and it's met with very mixed success. Um, and I think part of that is because actually, you know, not all the potentialities, uh, you know, and you could think about. You know, uh, community conditions, leadership talent, uh, business assets and infrastructure, government support, lack of government interference, you know, all those ingredients, if you like, that led to the Armal story being successful uh, won't always be found in the same way everywhere. You know, and, and one of the things we're very keen to do as we lay out these stories is not to suggest that everyone should set up dairy co-ops in, in the manner of Armal or should go into ecotourism in the way Costa Rica has, but to uh, do the next level of learning about you know what are the processes of change that we could engage with and the domains of change that we engage with around businesses and market rules that could help stimulate these sorts of uh, uh, progressions. Uh, Irfan, did you have thoughts on on UHT? Uh, just to maybe offer that um, the Amal brand is definitely clearly the market leader in kind of UHT package set from in India mm -hmm. and one of, the, one of the perspectives we've heard from Amul managers is that that's one of the ways in which they are actually able to keep returns to farmers stable because while the, while the price of milk as a liquid commodity keeps fluctuating, the price of tetra milk, tetra pack of milk never goes down. So by playing in mm -hmm. that, that portion of the value chain in those products, they're actually able to um, stabilize income for farmers. Okay, great. Well, look, um, I, I, that, those were the, that's the softball questions. Now, now the hardball questions start. I'm afraid. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to attempt to to synthesise two questions actually that have come in from Zenebe and Marcus, and they're essentially both I think asking the same thing, which is that the the stories that you've told are, are about as you explained at the beginning of your presentation, they're about um, the historical trajectory of certain industries, the milk industry in, in India and, and tourism in Costa Rica. Um, but most of us, or many of us listening to this webinar are, are, are people who work in, in sort of projects that are designated development programs aiming at, to achieve market systems development. And so the question for us is, what, what, what can we learn from these stories that you've um, reviewed about how 
to use how to act as agents of change to amplify change what what where where you know where there's a conscious effort being made by a development program to to affect positive pro poor change what do these stories tell us about the um the ways of doing that yeah no, that obviously is, is the central question. Um, I, I should say before I dive in that there were various development actors uh, involved in uh, several of these stories. Uh, it's just that they weren't the central actors. Um, so many of them came in to support, to fund, uh, to advise uh, different actors within these stories at various points and clearly did contribute to the outcomes that, that we saw. They just weren't the central uh, protagonists, if you like, um, but I think that also reflects part of what you know we think is true coming out of this. That actually, um, you know, those of us who are facilitators of this are unlikely to be the protagonists of changes in market systems uh, where we may not be kind of permanently uh, embedded in those systems. And so it is more likely that um, you know local entrepreneurs, local businesses, local government institutions. Um, civil society, social movements, uh, are likely to be the protagonists in the stories of change in, in their own systems. Um, and I think that informs our whole approach, which is described in more detail in the report, but it's, it's in essence a, a process of trying to unearth potentialities within the system for change and then trying to amplify those and support those um, in a way that's adaptive, because we won't know exactly which ones will pay off in, you know, particularly kind of significant change until we go through that process uh, of, of working with them. And what's interesting for me, certainly and for our team, because we, we came into this work 11 years ago, as I said, from the business side. And I would say that we were quite well attuned to looking for potentiality on the business side. You know, we wouldn't um, certainly, you know, from the way that we were working, um, go to a business and tell them, well, you need to do A, B, and C, you know, do it our way. You know, our role was generally to support businesses to or on, look for entrepreneurs who had a great idea and a lot of potential and support them to do what they were planning to do and hopefully guide and support them on the way. Um, but we realized that when we turned our attentions to government and policy and rules, we tended to think in a completely different way. Uh, and it was more about, well, how do we convince them to do what we think is right? Um, and and we think that that's, that's really a, a, a disconnect that we see in our own work in, in development and, and market systems development, that actually what we should be doing more of is looking for where there's innovation and change makers in all the different sectors and all the different parts of the system, you know, that are working on it and trying to amplify and support those potentialities across across the whole range. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just going a little bit deeper into this, do, do you, so there's a question here from Sabine, uh, ASI. Does this offer us any optimism about achieving really deep inclusion, you know, leaving no one behind? Um, are there any lessons here about um, for example, business models and practices that include poor women in a sustainable manner? Um, yes, I think so. Um, so I think the first thing we would say is we need to have the right lens. So even this, you know, I mean, and I'm not by any means saying that everyone must adopt this five, uh, you know, five pointed uh, framework that we shared at the beginning. but something like that that helps us understand um, different aspects of inclusion and equity um, or sustainability too if you want to put that in um, and then trying to understand that in the context of different dimensions of marginalization or exclusion that uh, might be being experienced at the moment so even having that lens um, I think helps us understand where we're making progress, where we're not making progress or indeed where we might be causing some harm or exacerbating current patterns of inequity, right? So having the, the, the right lens to kind of look at the problem and understand how your work is, um, you know, maybe uh, affecting that problem as we move forward is, is key. Um, and then I think the second part of it is, you know, in this picture that we've painted, where it's not down to one single 
enterprise or you know one single part of government to drive the whole change i think we do create more possibilities for um, advancement on multiple aspects of inclusion and for multiple on multiple dimensions of, of exclusion and so one example would be you know in in a market system it's unlikely that any one actor you know any one business for instance um, would be able to simultaneously think about how it's going to optimally address all these different parts of, of inclusion and equity and think about simultaneously how it's going to you know, target various groups who are disadvantaged uh, in that process. But a combination of different actors might, might do so. So if we think about a lot of the ag um, livelihoods cases that we have in the report, um, you know, many of the groups that are central to that, the businesses are focused on uh, growth and participation, um, uh, but only up to a point, you know, so for, for instance, the inclusion of uh, excluded castes in Armour wasn't uh, something that necessarily came out from the business, but it was actually influenced by wider societal norms and the groups that were working around that. Uh, many of these things haven't uh, really focused on environmental sustainability. So in fact, it's been other players like Rainforest Alliance uh, and their certification schemes that have created that external pressure um, to meet a higher standard on environmental sustainability. Um, and, and those things all together, if you like, kind of create this uh, movement over time. But I think what we should be very wary of is one, you know, loading too much of this onto one player and saying you must be responsible for achieving all of these things simultaneously, uh, but instead thinking about this kind of web of different actors and forces acting on the system. Um, and the other part is, you know, believing that it must all be achieved simultaneously in, you know, in one go, if you like, because we don't see that in any of the cases either. You know, so it tends to be that, um, it, you know, you'll make progress in certain aspects of inclusion first, you know, and then move over to other aspects because that's the way the market um, the market moves. Um, but it's very important, of course, not to lose sight of that. You know, we shouldn't um, say, well, just because it's done one thing well, you know, we should then give up on all the other aspects of inclusion um, that, that we care about. Okay, very, very interesting. Look, I'm, I'm going to Go, I'm going to push you even a little bit further, Harvey, because uh, you're doing such a great job of fielding these questions. But what, what do you think we as practitioners can do to encourage people who fund uh, programs to spend, you know, to invest a bit more time and effort in tracking the history of or trajectory of particular market systems, rather than sort of the obvious pressures to, to sort of find quick wins. That's <laughs> you had you had to get there eventually, Mike. Um, I I don't know that this is about uh, you know that this is an argument about methodology. I think this always comes back to an argument about uh, impact and what we're trying to change. Um, you know, I think probably most of us who are on this call, you know, share a sense of frustration about how difficult it is to achieve you know, truly systemic, truly deep change um, in, in the context we're working in. And, you know, so for as long as, you know, we have program designs and funding structures that don't allow us to really tackle deep systemic change, uh, it's very difficult to see how, you know, we have lasting change in, in the world and, we, you know, that we'll see the impact that we won't actually uh, achieve. And so I think it does come back to that. It's understanding, um, you know, and I think that's where hopefully this evidence base that we've put together is useful, you know, and I've been having conversations with funders um, over the past few months and kind of going through this evidence and saying, actually, you know, this is what change looks like. So unless, um, you know, you feel you're responding to this reality of change, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that what we can think that we're doing is engaging in, in the process of systemic change. There may be other things that you're very helpfully doing in terms of, 
you know, creating impact. You can have, you can create impact for a lot of people without necessarily engaging systemic change. And we're not saying that's the only thing you must do, you know. But if you if you think that you're engaging a process of systemic change, then you must react. You must respond to the reality of how it happens. Um, and to some extent, that's what we're trying to lay out in in this piece of work. And. Uh... I suppose that the final, the cherry on that particular cake, or the problem, it's not really a cake, it's a problem, is, is, is the question of attribution. And a couple of people have asked about how you, mm -hmm. wh whether you see any sort of solutions to the, the problem of, of finding, of, of finding ways to attribute the contribution that, you know, a particular actor or development agencies played in any kind of change process like this. Is it an impossible task, or is there, is there any kind of way to, to, to find some kind of attributable uh, impact? Uh, I, I think we would definitely be, you know, closer to the view that says this is about contribution rather than, rather than attribution. Um, of course, we understand the pressures that people are under, you know, ourselves included, to, to um, explain, you know, what, what we've done and how that's contributed to the outcome. Um, I, but I wonder also if that's because, you know, if, if that might be helped by a reframing of the conversation around what we what we do when we go back to evaluate and monitor and, and learn. And so one of the things that we talk about in the report is, uh, you know, interestingly how so much of the effort that goes uh, into monitoring, learning, and evaluation. Um, is done at two extremes, if you like, of, of the of the causal chain. You know that on one hand it's kind of what we're doing in terms of inputs and activities, and on the other hand it's kind of you know what the long term outcomes in terms of what uh, you know beneficiaries communities are experiencing. What we don't spend very much time talking about is what's actually changing in the system, uh, and by that I mean things like relationships and dynamics between different actors and structures. Um, and, and that's really kind of where the meat of it is. You know, if you thought that you were kind of accompanying a system on a, on a journey of change, that's where you should be focusing the majority of your MLE effort. Uh, but normally that's where we focus uh, the least because it's also the messiest part to really understand. And so I think, uh, you know, part of what would help us, I think, have a different conversation, um, both internally and with people who are funding us, is getting more into you know, that kind of conversation where we're actually learning about what's changing, what's moving um, within the system and, and using that to adapt to what we're doing uh, going forward. Now, that doesn't always create the certainty that, you know, what you're doing is responsible for the, for the end outcome, you know, but it does at least show that you are engaged, you know, in the system's processes of change uh, in, in a deep way. But there is no silver bullet. <laughs> so I do appreciate you pushing us on that, Mike. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think if we had the, the answer to that, we would we'd all be in a, better, in a better situation than we are today. That's well, the next I, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, try, for, for, for a very credible uh, attempt to answer the question and, and uh, for making, you know, for, for putting it down, putting it out there. That's, um, that's very good of you. Um, we have, Harvey, we have run out of time. Um, we've, there were a few more questions, but I hope, I hope everyone who, who very kindly posted questions will appreciate that I wasn't able to ask them all. I've tried to synthesize a few of them together where possible. Um, before we before we say goodbye to Harvey and Afan, I just wanted to make a plea to all of you to who've been who've enjoyed this webinar to fill out the uh, little webinar survey evaluation form that the link to which has just been posted in the chat box. That would be very much appreciated. Um, the recording of this webinar and indeed the questions that you've posed will be placed on the uh, web on a webinar page on the beam exchange website uh, which so you if you want to come back and listen to this again or you want to uh, recommend one of your colleagues listen to this discussion uh, you'll be very in, in a couple of days we'll have that webinar link up and you can send them a link to the recording 
you'll find it in the, uh, the, the web, our, our, you'll find our, our webinar page with all our webinars recordings are on the, in the link that's also just been posted in the chat box by uh, my colleague Isabel very kindly. So with that, I will say um, thanks very much for joining us. There's another webinar next month 